Good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Tripp. I'm a uh, wildlife disease researcher at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And today I'm going to talk to you all about uh, Colorado's plague management and uh, plague research programs that we conduct uh, here in Colorado. So off we go. Um, first, I'll start with just a little bit of background. Um, what is plague? Um, plague is the disease that's caused by uh, infection with the bacteria Yersinia pestis. Um, Yersinia pestis causes infections in humans and animals, and if you become infected, it can lead to septic shock um, and death. It's a problem. Um, the questions I get a lot is where did plague come from and, and how did it become such a global pathogen? Um, the, the map here shows us some hypothesized routes of plague transmission um, across the globe, um, starting uh, from its endemic area in Asia and Africa. The um, yellow or orange arrows uh, show us the, the routes of transmission um, of what's known as Justinian's plague um, in, in the 500s. Um, and then uh, the red arrows show us routes of transmission of the Black Death, um, the 400 year period in the 13 through 1700s that wiped out uh, large chunks of, of Europe. Um, and then we can see from the, the black arrows, that's the modern, the modern pandemic. You can see how that got moved around the world um, and introduced into Western North America in about 1900, um, likely um, from uh, grain ships with uh, rats uh, carrying fleas. Um, and so that's, that's how this pathogen got moved um, all around the world. And currently today, there are over 200 mammalian species that um, can become infected or have been reported infected with plague. Um, kind of focusing down here into North America, this, this map shows us uh, county level data of occurrence of plague. Um, this data is a little bit out of, out of date, but what's important is that you can see plague has become um, somewhat ubiquitous across the landscape in Western North America. Um, again, with an introduction into the Bay Area, the port in San Francisco, in, in 1900 and then uh, eastward spread um, with uh, inner or with uh, first reports in Colorado in, in 1941 and then some more recent expansion into uh, Western South Dakota in the early 2000s. Um, so the state has shown us we've, we've got a pretty um, widespread problem. Um, focusing down even further into, into just Colorado, um, Yersinia pestis is a non-native pathogen. It's uh, something we hear a lot. Um, it's, it didn't evolve here. It's not supposed to be here. Our wildlife aren't uh, prepared to deal with it. Um, first reported in San Miguel County in the southwest part of the state in 1941. Um, and then throughout the 40s, it appeared statewide um, in all of the prairie dog species that we have. Um, it's currently very well established. Again, you can see from the map um, human, wildlife, flea data, it's, it's really in, in all four corners of the state um, and um, doesn't appear to be going, uh, going away. So as a wildlife management agency, why are we worried about um, plague? Why are we worried about uh, you know, a, a disease that's most associated with humans? Um, well, C Colorado in this map is kind of right in the bullseye of uh, prairie dog range. We've got black-tailed prairie dogs, white-tailed prairie dogs, gunnison prairie dogs that pretty much cover up um, the state of Colorado. Um, and all of these species are um, experiencing uh, range-wide reductions in abundance. Um, and so this, this creates um, lots of wildlife management problems for us. Um, specifically, we're, um, we're working to uh, recover the endangered black-footed ferret back into Colorado. Um, we have huge swaths of our state our um, black-tailed prairie dog habitat, black-tailed prairie dogs have been warranted for protection under the ESA. Um, and then gunnison prairie dogs in the southwest part of the state um, have been uh, warranted for protection as well. And um, as, a, as a wildlife management agency, one of our major goals is to try and keep these species on the landscape and keep them from requiring uh, endangered species status protection. Um, but it's not, just, it's not just an issue of prairie dogs. Um, Plague is a real ecosystem disease, if you will. Um, we have uh, any number of species are impacted by plague, and that's either because their main food source or their main prey item is prairie dogs, um, or their habitat where they live are prairie dog burrows. Um, and so 
um, plague is, is, is an issue that has um, a wide reach in Colorado and really affects a lot of our um, ecosystems and a lot of our wildlife. So, um, you know, given that this is so widespread and is such a big problem for us, is there anything that we can actually do about it? Um, and and the, the main tool that we've been using and that folks um, in North America use is, is vector control um, with an insecticide called Delta Methrin or, or a product um, sold as Delta Dust. Um, and it's a synthetic insecticide and it's, it's labeled for use in uh, prairie dog or rodent burrows. And the goal is to apply four um, to six grams of this um, dust uh, powdered insecticide into prairie dog burrows. And um, although this sounds very simple, it's actually quite hard to achieve. Um, to give you some sense of, of some of the things we're, we're trying to do, this, this blue outline is a polygon um, of a, the area of a prairie dog colony. Um, and that's how we start with a, with a GIS layer telling us where our prairie dogs are. Um, and then we take um, you know, technicians with, uh, with equipment and they um, work through the colony on foot. And this green line would be a, um, a track log of um, that person's movement through the colony and they dusting burrows as they go. And when you add in um, all the technicians um, over the course of a day, they fill in the colony and hopefully that's what it looks like. Hopefully they got all of the burrows as they, um, as they worked through the colony. Um, and one of the issues is, is the equipment. Which, which type of equipment should we use to, um, to do this job? There are lots of com commercially available uh, equipment um, and uh, none of it is really built, uh, purpose built for what we're trying to do. And so that's prevented us with, uh, from doing a really good job and, and presented some problems for us to solve. Um, so at Parks and Wildlife, we, we knew we had issues with equipment. We knew our equipment wasn't really reliable and was hard to repair. Uh, so we built some prototype um, dusters that run on uh, paintball tanks, uh, compressed air um, that allowed us to be mobile um, and, and hopefully do a better job at applying the um, dust in the burrows. And then we just did a, a quick experiment. I, I guess it wasn't real quick. It took us um, several years and, and a couple hundred thousand prairie dog burrows of um, collecting data. Um, but what we found was in, in just a simple comparison of, of um, dust output in this figure, um, you can see that the, the red and orange dots are commercially available dusters that we have been using. And the blue and the green dots are the prototype dusters that we built. Um, the horizontal axis is the operating time needed to achieve four to six grams of burrow uh, of dust per burrow, which is the gray um, kind of highlighted portion of the graph. So without really digging into it too hard, it's pretty easy to see that uh, we have really variable data points in the red and the orange. Um, and our, our, our prototype dusters are performing um, quite well. Um, all of those points are within the, uh, within the target range and it's only taking one second to do it. Um, so we're faster and we're more efficient with the prototypes. And I think what's really important is um, a lot of folks will apply a standard operating time um, for the units, say five seconds. Um, so the instruction will be run each one of these dusters for five seconds to hit the target. Well, in this case, if we would have done that with the commercial dusters, 60% of our equipment would have failed to dispense the four to six grams of dust required to control fleas. Um, and so this is, was clearly a, a problem. And if we hadn't have been recording the data to tell us how much dust we'd been putting in the burrows, we wouldn't have known that we were not hitting our targets. Um, and then uh, currently we're working to um, adapt this equipment that was built for um, on foot or backpack use um, onto a more ATV friendly um, system. Uh, so instead of using um, tanks of compressed air, it's using a, um, a air compressor on the unit. And I think this is going to be um, something that we can use going forward um, for our plague management program. From all the work that we've done uh, dusting over the years, um, there's, there's a few pretty simple take home messages and, and that's that quanti quality control monitoring is absolutely necessary. Um, it doesn't really matter what type of duster you're using. Um, it's really important to measure the dust, weigh the dust that goes into the units, keep track of how many burrows are being dusted so that you can 
uh, really quickly calculate whether you're achieving your, your grams per burrow target or not. Um, and if you don't do that, underdosing is, is really likely, if not almost a certainty. Um, and underdosing of the insecticide in the burrows is going to definitely reduce the efficacy of the vector control. Um, and, and almost more alarming is it may accelerate the development of resistance to the insecticide in that flea population. Um, and then as, as a group, not just at Parks and Wildlife, but for everybody that is trying to do plague management with insecticides, we need to continue to develop and improve and maintain our equipment so that we're just more effective and efficient at that, um, at that endeavor. So um, again, to just kind of wrap it up a little bit, um, the, the dust distributed properly is effective for eight to 10 months. Um, that leaves us exposed for two to four months on these colonies. It's labor intensive to visit all the burrows. Um, a lot of times folks will wait until they have a, a plague infected carcass or some noticeable mortality and then they'll start dusting. And oftentimes that's that reactive, uh, that reactive step is too slow, um, plague is already, decimated the population by the time you've mobilized to dust. Um, and, uh, and there's always the potential for resistance to the, to the insecticide. So it was really clear we needed additional plague management tools, um, which really uh, lit the fire under the idea of, of a vaccine. Could we use a vaccine to protect prairie dogs from plague? Um, and so our, our collaborators at um, the USGS, the National Wildlife Health Center in, in uh, Wisconsin, in Dr. Roki's lab, had been uh, working for a really long time to develop an oral vaccine for prairie dogs. And their vaccine is a, is a raccoon pox vectored uh, viral vaccine that expresses the F1 and B protein antigens um, from Yersinia pestis. And uh, after vaccination, 90% of prairie dogs survived challenge with plague in the laboratory. Those were really encouraging results. Saw similar results in multiple species of prairie dogs. And we, we noted that young prairie dogs were more responsive to vaccination than old ones, um, which wasn't a real surprise. And um, this, um, you know, these, these laboratory trials um, led us to get approval from uh, Center for Veterinary Biologics to start um, field trials. The one step we had to do before we could start field trials was um, to look at, the, look at the baits and try and figure out how are we gonna get these prairie dogs to eat these baits. Um, and without getting into it too much, we looked at, um, how many baits per acre, what time of year, um, is the bait palatable, and what sort of biomarker could we use to monitor bait uptake. And those were all things that we worked through before we got into the field with the vaccine. And then um, in 2012 in, in Colorado, we did uh, field safety trials um, on Gunnison and Blacktail prairie dogs. Um, and we observed high vaccine uptake with the biomarker. 95% uh, of the prairie dogs had consumed one of these baits. We saw no evidence of adverse effects in prairie dogs or um, other non-target rodents that consumed the baits. And uh, you know, um, the, the vaccine appeared to be effective um, and safe for um, use in prairie dog colonies. And that really started the, the, the bigger, more broader research that we started. Um, that led us to, to phase two, or what we, we called the field efficacy trials. Um, and this was a, a really large multidisciplinary um, cooperative um, group of people. Um, this trial was conducted in over seven states with state, federal, tribal partners, even municipal partners, and um, really was a, was a huge effort by everybody to move this project forward. Um, in Colorado, we tested the vaccine against placebo baits, but we also monitored um, prairie dog populations on dusted colonies to um, see if we could compare efficacy of these tools. We focused on as large plots as we could, and we conducted the study in 2013 through 15. Um, we measured plague and fleas and prairie dog carcasses. We um, looked at burrow activity in colony area. We looked at flea abundance in prairie dogs and in prairie dog burrows and we monitored prey dog survival and abundance and density um, by looking at um, marked and recaptured prey dogs. So give you just a little bit of a sense of how, you know, how we did some of this work, that red, that red polygon um, up there is a 40 acre prey dog colony and all the straight black lines are um, GIS generated transects that are 10 meters apart. And we would walk along these transects with a Ziploc bag full of baits and dropping these baits every 10 meters. Um, and it was a lot of work, but for this um, original kind of startup um, field trials, that's, that's how we did it. And so you can see each one of those dots is a bait that got dropped um, in the landscape. Um, and, and the photo below shows us kind of what, 
sort of areas that this that this looks like. Um, and then after the baits went down, we did a lot of capture of prairie dogs and, and non-target species, um, just to get a sense of what some of the field work looked like. We're collecting fleas from, from prairie dogs. Um, we're collecting hair and whisker samples. That photo there on the bottom, those are, are whiskers from a prairie dog. Um, and we could take those whiskers and put them under a microscope with the proper UV filter. And if that prairie dog had eaten a rhodamine B uh, biomarker bait, um, the, the hair follicle would glow orange like that. So that's how we could tell um, whether we were getting bait uptake in the field or not. Um, and our blacktail prey dog replicate was done on uh, city of Fort Collins property up near the Wyoming state line um, at the soapstone, soapstone prairie natural area. Um, and we, uh, I guess we were lucky. We had a lot of plague in the landscape when we conducted this study. And, and that's what we can see here from these red lines. Um, all of the colonies between the red lines were impacted by plague in that year. So from 13 to uh, 14 and then on into 15, plague moved in a northerly uh, in a northerly way and all of the colonies um, on this complex that didn't receive some form of plague management were um, essentially wiped out. Um, you'll see this map a couple times through the presentation and um, what you'll see is that the purple shaded areas are, are vaccine plots, the green shaded areas are placebo plots, and the yellow shaded areas are colonies um, or plots that received the, the dusting treatment. Um, I'll, I'll try and move kind of quick through some of our results here, um, but um, the, the, the results were really variable based on when plague affected the plot um, and, and how many doses of vaccine these prairie dogs got during the study. So um, these plots are the ones down, uh, I don't know if you can see the curse or not, but these are the, the plots that are down in the, in the, in the south uh, east sort of, of area. And they were the first to be affected by plague um, and, and what you'll see is the placebo, the placebo plots that uh, didn't get any treatment, um, they were decimated by plague. And we really saw the same thing with the vaccine treatment. The vaccine was not effective, um, basically because the prairie dogs were already dying of plague as we were trying to give them a vaccine bait. We were just too late in this case. Um, we needed to get these baits on the ground a lot earlier. But what was interesting is the dusted plot, um, we had, virtually no fleas, which are represented by these bars. Um, we had we'd done really good flea control and um, we had no plague positive samples and that population on that dusted plot persisted in the face, to face of plague. Um, on, our next, on our next replicate, which is uh, the, the MSR group um, in, in this area here, it's kind of a similar story. Um, once plague got in there, the placebo plot was completely wiped out. Um, the vaccine plot had, um, had a little bit longer time. We were able to get the baits into these prairie dogs and they were able to eat them. Um, and, and, then, and then plague really started to impact them. And we saw a big decrease in their population, huge increases as shown in the bars in the numbers of fleas and the number of plague positive fleas on the landscape. Um, so in, in this case, the vaccine afforded some protection better than the placebo plot, um, but we still saw a pretty good drop off in the population. Whereas again, same story with the dust. We're seeing uh, virtually no fleas, no plague, and this uh, population um, persists. Um, on our third, our third replicate, we, we didn't have a lot of plague in the system until we were able to get two doses of the vaccine into these prairie dogs. So again, the story's the same with the placebo plot um, that was wiped out by plague. The vaccine plot um, with, with two doses now, so two annual doses of vaccine before they've encountered plague, and uh, we, again, we see a decrease, but um, uh, it's a lot more stable than what we saw on the placebo plots or on the other plots. So it's a pretty good indicator that the vaccine was protecting um, some of these prairie dogs on the landscape. And then the big surprise was on the dust plot, that looks, that, that line, that proportion of active burrows line looks real similar to the placebo plot. Um, we see some fleas and we see plague positive fleas. So in this case, um, the dust failed to protect that uh, that plot from plague. Um, so what did we what did we learn from this experiment? Um, well, both both dust and vaccine could protect uh, prairie dogs from plague, at least from the standpoint of preventing their their complete uh, collapse of their colony. Um, neither one of these treatments was perfect, um, and and which treatment you use would probably depend on whether your goals were immediate protection or more of a long term 
um, you know, protection that you might get with vaccine. Um, and then we felt that we should be using both of these tools in a, in a plague management program um, to kind of offset their, um, you know, their checks and balances or their, their positives and negatives. Um, and then um, clearly treating small plots, uh, small plots on large colonies or small colonies in large, long, large complexes was not going to be effective. We needed to scale up. And in order to scale up, we needed more efficient vaccine production and more efficient bait distribution. So in 2016, USGS did a, a technology transfer with Colorado Serum Company in, in Denver, Colorado um, uh, to start making the vaccine um, to be available on, on uh, a larger scale. Um, bait production, we made some changes at Parks and Wildlife on how we make those baits. We moved from um, cutting them by hand in batches of a couple hundred to um, a more mechanized mass, uh, mass production where we're doing um, bait production in lots of 4,000 baits. Um, so we're at least 10 times more efficient at making the baits now. We uh, got rid of the red rhodamine B biomarker and switched over to just blue food dye that allowed us to make a more palatable bait um, and make them a little bit smaller as well. Um, the other huge piece of the puzzle was, was distribution in the field. We had to get away from walking around with Ziploc bags full of bait. So uh, worked with uh, Model Avionics, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the World Wildlife Fund to um, build these prototype three shooter or triple shooter um, uh, bait distribution machines. There's a GPS unit in it. And as you drive along, it throws one bait to the right, one bait to the left and drop, uh, drops one out the bottom. And again, this is at least 10 times more efficient than, than the way we had been doing it. And we can treat uh, 50 to 80 acres in one hour with one machine. So um, with these advancements in um, efficiency, we were able to actually start thinking about adaptive plague management on larger scales. On our soapstone uh, uh, complex, we continued with these plague treatments and actually scaled them up. And then we continue to monitor um, colony area, colony occupancy, are the prey dogs still there? And then also um, could conduct these, these burrow activity surveys. So that would be the proportion of burrows, their scores active um, across the landscape. <clears throat> um, and to give you some sense of what we've seen kind of since the end of the, the phase two project in, in, in 2015, um, this line shows us, um, uh, colonies that have received no treatment. So again, as plague moved across this complex in uh, 2013, 14, and 15, um, the burrow activity on those colonies dropped to near zero, and we've seen a little bit of recovery, but we're uh, starting from a pretty rough uh, spot in 2015 and 2016. Uh, this, dot, this dashed line shows us that, that one colony from the experiment I showed before where the dust kind of failed to protect these prairie dogs. So we see a little bit better response um, from the dust in this case, but it's, it really kind of mimics what we're seeing from the placebo or the no treatment um, in this case. So this is what we're really trying to avoid or, or treatments that are, are not effective. Um, the, the blue line that I just put up are, are um, colonies that have been vaccine, vaccinated only. Um, and again, we see, uh, we see a decline once plague gets into that system, but um, it's much more stable than these other two lines. Um, and this is something that we, I think we can work with here. And if we combine both of the treatments, vaccine and dust with this uh, black line here on the top, we see that that's definitely the most effective way um, to, to do this, um, to, to get um, plague management is to combine these tools. Um, so, uh, you know, lines on a graph are um, a fine way to uh, think about data, but, um, uh, the, the story is really better told in a, in a series of, of maps here. So um, in, this, in this context here, this is the, 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 one, the one plot that we, um, we put all three treatments in, in, one, in one colony. Um, placebo in the north, vaccine kind of in the middle and, and the green area got the dust treatment. <clears throat> those red boxes are the plots, each one is 100 acres. And this is, this is what this colony looked like in, in 2012, the year before we started the experiment. In, in 2013, the colony had grown. We started the experiment at 900 acres. Um, and again, with the three, with the three treatment plots uh, shown. And in 2013, we put the first baits down. Um, and in 2014, we put the second, uh, second treatment down. 
But in 2014, uh, these yellow dots show us that we're starting to get plague positive fleas out of prairie dog burrows. So those are the locations of burrows where we knew we were uh, we had plague. Uh, we got this data kind of really late in the year in 2014. And as we went through the overwinter period and into 2015, uh, I was really anxious and nervous to see what we were gonna what we were gonna encounter in, in 2015. Um, and in, in 2015, it was as bad as we thought it was gonna be. The placebo plot uh, is completely blew up with plague. Um, there were no prairie dogs left. Um, it, it, it killed every prairie dog on the plot. The, the dusted plot down below, you can see went from a big block of about 600 acres of, of dusted prairie dogs to um, these little fragmented bits that were left. But in the middle, that, that vaccine plot uh, pretty much held its own. Um, and, and even with this really strong plague challenge of, of plague rolling across the landscape, that patch of prairie dogs that got the vaccine for two consecutive years uh, maintained itself on the landscape. In 2016, we continue to see the vaccine plot uh, grow and the, the dusted fragments start to coalesce back into a functional unit. And in uh, 2017, ferrets are actually released on this uh, vaccinated portion of the colony, which was a big, um, which was a big step. Uh, in 2018, during spotlight surveys, ferrets are observed on that vaccinated portion. And again, um, all these years later on the, on the northern placebo plot, there's not a single prairie dog that's recolonized that area. Um, and and the, the dusted area continues to um, uh, coalesce and grow. 2019, we see wild born kits uh, on the vaccine plot. So um, pretty decent indicator that at least these ferrets, this, this group of ferrets was, was liking to call this vaccine plot home. Um, and in 2020, um, last year with fall spotlight surveys, again, we were uh, finding ferrets in the vaccinated portion of the colony. So that kind of leaves us to where, where we are today and, and how we go forward. And, and what uh, I think what we're looking at on this graph, this is a dose response curve. So this is how much vaccine we put in these baits and, and what that does. And so um, you can see that um, if you, if you kind of shoot for the middle of the graph here and you put one or two doses of, of vaccine in, in the bait, um, you get about 40% seroconversion. Um, and that might be okay if you're trying to just keep a few prey dogs on the landscape and, and speed recovery. Um, if, you, if you cut that down and only put one fifth of a dose um, into the bait, you save a ton of money. Um, you can probably put a lot more baits on the landscape um, but you're only going to protect 20% of the prairie dogs that eat those baits. You only get 20% circumversion, and that's just really not very good, or not, that's, that's not what we're trying to do. Um, but if you, if you take that the other direction and you put um, up to eight doses of vaccine in the bait, um, you, can, you can get 90% seroconversion. Um, and that's the, that's the target. If we're talking about black-footed ferret recovery, we really need to be uh, limiting plague to the point where um, there's very little plague in the landscape because those ferrets will find it. <clears throat> um, and so this is where we are in the balancing act of, of trying to figure out cost versus efficacy in here and, and really focus on in that middle portion of the graph and that $11 range, are there things we can do to make the vaccine more efficacious at that more affordable level? And that's a lot of the work that we're focused on right now. To kind of kind of sum up where we are and the, the challenges we face. Um, you know, we, we continue to uh, optimize our plague management tools. Um, we need to drive the cost of the vaccine down or figure out a way to push the efficacy of the vaccine up. Um, and we can do that by improving the, the vaccine construct, just make a better vaccine. Um, or we can try and manipulate the vaccine that we do have with some uh, post-production treatments to try and make the vaccine uh, more available in the bait for the prairie dogs to consume. Um, there uh, is more work to do with optimizing the dose and the bait density. So is there an interplay between how, how much vaccine we put in the bait and how many baits we put on the landscape? It, it doesn't necessarily have to be one dose in one bait. Um, you know, we can, we can play with that range a little bit to see where we can be most effective at getting vaccine into the prairie dogs. Um, we continue to struggle to get um, get juveniles vaccinated. Um, the, the bait uptake is best late in the year in October when the vegetation is dry. 
but that leaves that juvenile cohort exposed um, all spring and all summer. So uh, we need to continue to, to try and figure out a way to get baits um, or vaccine into that juvenile cohort, which will help get us to herd immunity um, a lot quicker. Um, I, I think the, the gains that we've been able to make um, in, in getting a functional plague management system um, has been in investing in the distribution equipment and infrastructure and that's stuff that we need to continue to do so we can get our efficiencies. Uh, tracking down funding is always something for disease management and wildlife. That's a problem that we all have to try and uh, keep, the, keep the project moving forward. And then I think most importantly is we need to continue to do plague management in an adaptive way. Uh, we need to apply these treatments, do the monitoring long term, and then learn and adjust um, as we go. Um, and with that, that is the end of my presentation. And um, I think we will take questions at a later um, part of the um, session today. So uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it.